Today, we are going to be building a 5-inch freestyle quadcopter, which is something I've done many, many times before on my channel. But what makes this build different is that it's going to involve the DJI O3 air unit. This is the very first time I have put a DJI O3 air unit into a 5-inch freestyle build of my very own. Come along with me. I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. All right, folks, time to put this guy up in the air. It's the perfect weather for a maiden flight. But uh, I know you guys don't want to be see a build without a flight in it as well. So we're going to give it a go. <laughs> I'll tell you more about it after we get in the air. Here are the parts that we're going to be using in this build. Obviously, the video transmitter and camera is going to be the DJI O3 air unit. That's DJI's new hot snot video transmitter with 4K onboard recording, 1080p video transmission. If you haven't already seen the reviews of it, I'll put a link to my review of it down in the video description. But let's, uh, let's assume you probably know what I'm talking about. The frame. Uh, now, the frame was a little bit tricky to choose because many frames nowadays do not fit the DJI O3 camera. It is 20 millimeters wide and it is too wide to fit between the standoffs of a lot of frames. Uh, but this one is the Vanover, Alex Vanover Vanny style frame and Vanover has updated it to be able to fit the O3 camera. We'll see how good of a job it does at doing that when we get to the end of the build. This is a really cool frame that I have wanted to try out since I saw Vanover flying it. It's got some very interesting design choices that we'll go over as we get further into the build. Our flight controller is going to be the SpeedyB F7 and the corresponding SpeedyB ESC. And uh, you might think I would put my very own JBF7 flight controller in there, and I do love the JBF7. They made it just for me, but I can't deny that the SpeedyB F7 is an incredible value. Uh, it comes in at something like $80 for the ESC and the flight controller together. I can't remember if that's the price for the F4 or the F7, but it is one of the least expensive flight controller and ESC combos you can buy today, and it doesn't skimp on features. And so that is what we're going to be putting into this build. For motors, we're going to be using the Rush FPV 2505.5 that half millimeter really matters. 2505.5 Farouk FPV motor. These are fascinating motors. They are much wider and shorter than most motors in this sort of five inch class. Uh, and I have some opinions about how they might perform, but we're just gonna put them on here and try them out. So we're gonna start the construction of the frame by finding this plate with all of the <laughs> Myriad press nuts in it. And we're gonna flip that over to the back side so we can see it's been milled out here for countersunk nuts, very, very nice. And we're gonna get these two little uh, Tetris looking blocks. And these little blocks are gonna fit into these two holes here and here. You'll see later in the build how these little blocks help sort of hold the whole arm assembly together and add stiffness and rigidity. 
Now, mine went in pretty smoothly, but Vanover points out in his assembly video that sometimes you might have to tap them in. They might be a little bit snug and a little bit tight. It just depends on where in the sort of milling process they were, whether the drill bit was brand new and sharp or whether it was a little bit dull. The tolerances always change a little bit as you go through that process. And any frame has to be designed to take that into account. In a case of a part like this, where you need the part to fit very, very precisely, you basically make the hole a little bit small so that at the beginning of the run you have to, um, it, the parts will be a little snug, but then by the end of the run they won't be loose. Hey there folks, it's Joshua from the future here. Uh, there's something you need to know about this frame if you're mounting the O3 camera. Do you see the difference between these two plates? Uh, let me make it more obvious. Do you see that one of these plates is, uh, it's about four millimeters wider than the other bottom plate. Uh, this is the frame plate that comes with the O3 kit. Uh, it's a little bit wider to let to make room for the O3 camera and let you push that camera forward just a little bit so you don't have props and standoffs in view. If you try to use the O3 camera with the standard frame kit, you're going to have a lot harder time making it fit. Vanover says it can be done. I'm not quite sure how. I, I personally don't, don't see how you would do it. If you're using a standard camera, a 19 millimeter wide camera, or the original DJI camera, then you can use the standard frame kit. But if you're using the O3, you're going to want to make sure you use this. This is not, I thought they were identical and he just sent me a spare. They're not identical. Next, we're going to take the bottom plate, which is this one, and it doesn't appear to have an upside or a downside, so I don't think that matters. And we're just going to place it onto those two little pieces and put them together. And I'm already starting to see something here that I really, really like about this frame design because a lot of frames with this style where the four arms come together in the middle, when you're assembling them, the arms are all super loose and floppy and falling apart. And this is true of my QAVS as well. And it's a little bit of a struggle to sort of hold them all in place well, until you get the screws in to then sort of hold it together. And then once it's held together, then it's pretty easy to like change one arm. But just the assembly process can be really cumbersome. It looks to me like what Vanover has done is we've created this little sandwich and then the arms are just gonna slide in and be much easier to assemble uh, than many alternatives. Very clever. Next, we're gonna get four legs and four 12 millimeter screws, and we're gonna insert them into the plates. And there is only one right way to insert these. The holes will not line up any other way, so you don't have to worry too much about getting it wrong. I think it needs to go like this. The big hole will line up and the two screw holes will line up. Great. We're just gonna loosely tighten those down to hold the arm in place and we'll do that for all four of the arms. Can't help but notice that these screws are 10-9 and not 12-9 steel. Always would be better if they were 12-9, but 10-9's uh, not too shabby. 12-9 is a harder, more durable alloy that's gonna, uh, gonna just resist stripping out mostly. These M3 screws have a real tendency to strip out uh, and I want 12-9 is really the gold standard. Now we've got four arms installed and eight screws, and we can go around and we can tighten those screws up. Next, we're gonna take this little piece that Vanover calls the puzzle piece, and we're gonna turn it so the countersunk side is facing up, and we're gonna just drop it down in there. And this is gonna add additional rigidity to the frame. We're gonna grab one of these titanium countersunk screws. At least he says they're titanium. They're not magnetic, that's for damn sure. And we're just gonna screw it in here and cinch that down. And this is the part of the build where I like to stop assembling the frame and start putting the motors and the electronics on. I just noticed that these motors seem to have plastic insulation instead of silicon insulation. Um, that makes them a little harder to solder, especially if you're a beginner. And it just is a, it makes them feel cheap, to be honest with you. It's stiffer wire and it just, the only reason people use plastic insulation instead of silicon insulation is to save money and that uh, is a real shame. I don't know how much they saved over the cost of this motor by doing this, but I guarantee you, in my eyes at least, they have hurt the reputation of the motor by showing that they're gonna cut corners and it makes me wonder where else they cut corners. Maybe nowhere, maybe it doesn't matter. It's just not a good look. It's just not a good look. And through the magic of editing, we now have four motors installed. And the next thing to do is to install the ESC and then the flight controller. And I'm super, super pleased to see all of the accessories that come with this flight controller. 
so here we've got your standard assortment of screws, uh, as well as some extra vibration isolating gummies and a great big honking capacitor. And notice that they have taken the time to put heat shrink on the legs of the capacitor to keep it from short circuiting. That is an amazing, amazing step that they absolutely didn't have to do. It's great that they did it. We've got connectors here for a uh, standard camera uh, as or several different kinds of cameras. And here is the DJI and the ESC connector. And here is, are some connectors for your uh, receiver, your video transmitter, and even a GPS unit. You may or may not end up using these. And it's not even quite a solder-free build because you are gonna, for example, have to solder the receiver wires to your receiver. But it's it really has just taken a whole lot of the work out of the build for you. And it's a great, it's, so, it's such a small thing for Runcam to do this for 10,000 flight controllers, right? That they heat shrink this, you know, just crank them out. But it's really a great, great savings to uh, you as the person having to do the build. And it really shows that they put their thought into it. This is the stack screw that comes with the SpeedyB ESC and flight controller. And as you can see by comparing it to this standoff that comes with the frame, it is way too long. Always nice to be generous, I guess, but it's not gonna work with a low profile frame like this one. So, thank goodness I have this electric driver that Phantom FPV bought me as a Christmas present last year to help me take it out. So it looks like the Vanny style frame comes with some stack screws. They're basically just the longest screws in the kit and there are four of them. So now we can put the ESC down and I got to identify the front. Here's the front. So I'm going to flip this around. Here's the back. Is this going to be a problem? A lot of times when you have the ESC facing back here, it is too tight to mount something like an air unit or a Vista back here. You run out of room. Yeah, pretty tight. Not, I can see where the standoff's gonna be. It's not gonna be an issue there, but man, it's really gonna be crammed up against there. Whereas we usually have all this room in the front. So what I like to do is flip this around and mount the ESC facing backwards, facing forwards, I guess. And that gives me plenty of room. We're gonna try that and we're gonna see how that works out. The other thing I can do is I can go ahead and run this wire for the camera underneath the ESC so it stays out of the way. We just need to make sure it's not gonna get squished or anything. Oh yeah, look at that. These little rubber gummies have plenty of room. They include a little bit of standoff space. The wire is not getting crushed or anything. Nothing is at any risk. There's no screws sticking up that might touch the ESC. We are good to go here, I love it. And I'm just gonna get a little piece of double-sided mounting tape here and go ahead and stick this in place. That won't be our permanent mounting solution, but it'll do for now. Mm, is that a standoff hole as well? I think it is. We don't wanna get in the way of that, so. Next, we're gonna solder the XT60 lead to the ESC. So I'm gonna crank my soldering iron all the way up to the maximum temperature for these big honking joints. And I like to mount it coming out the side like this. So I'm just gonna look, this is the negative, this is the positive. So I'm just going to cut the positive one down to a little shorter length so it is the right length. And we will strip that. I'm just gonna strip that. Look how nicely that silicon insulation strips. Beautiful. That's just about right. That's gonna work out just fine. This is not a soldering tutorial. A lot of people who build quadcopters are unpracticed at soldering. If you would like to be better at soldering, I have a soldering tutorial for FPV beginners. I think it's well worth a watch and I'll put a link in the video description down below the video. If you have never, if you always just wing it, there's probably something you could learn from the video. I'm not trying to like sound presumptuous, but this is the OmniFixo third hand tool. It's the coolest effing third hand tool in the world. When you see how much it costs, you're gonna be like, that's ridiculous, but um, it's super freaking, it's a freaking amazing. I'll put a link to my review of it down in the video description. You can decide if it's worth it. I'm getting ahead of myself. I should insert the capacitor. They have little tiny holes for the capacitor too. I love it when they do that. Love it when the ESC manufacturers do that. So we can insert the capacitor legs through these little tiny holes from the bottom and just fold that over to hold it in place. And then we can solder on the XT60 and it'll all just be one joint. Very, very nice. See, the little magnetic doohickeys let you place it exactly where you want it. It's fantastic. 
and then we're gonna snip these extra capacitor legs off they don't get into anywhere they don't need to be and hope to goodness that we have enough room there <laughs> to fit the camera otherwise I might have should have mounted the capacitor a little differently yeah fingers crossed next we'll solder all four of the motor wires on and I just like to run them straight down the arm it doesn't matter which of the three wires goes to which of the three pads but I just like to run them straight down the arm for neatness and now the motors are all soldered up and I have also taped the wires down uh, I like to use this this is a kind of a cloth wire harness tape it's uh, I think it's pretty good for this purpose uh, I have it in about a two inch width which is just about right for the length of a five inch quadcopter arms you could get it in a narrower width it is fairly durable a little bit stretchy and uh, you know works for me but now we also run into the first problem of the build and that's what always makes these builds fun uh, especially when you're working with a frame that you're maybe not as familiar with or a flight controller and ESC stack that you're not as familiar with so here's the problem I have turned the ESC around to face forwards to give me more room to mount the air unit in the back and this is the part where those of you who like to build with 20 millimeter stacks can say well if you had a 20 millimeter stack you wouldn't have had this problem and you would be right it is what it is the problem is that the wire that goes between the ESC and the flight controller plugs into the back of the ESC and this is a little short stubby wire so the intent is that the ESC and the flight controller are lined up facing the same direction and that's fine that would be fine a flight controller can be installed backwards it's not a big deal but the wire that comes from the DJI air unit needs to go here I believe on the flight controller and that simply isn't going to work uh, it almost could work but no you don't want to have wires under tension like that that's just a no-go so what could we do well you could get this is a SH connector wire set with a bunch of SH connectors to let you make your own wire harnesses uh, it is a handy handy thing to have around but I wouldn't want to do that uh, if I could possibly avoid it Oh, link in the video description. You can get them from Race Day Quads and other places. Uh, instead, I have very, very fortunately found in my piles of stuff that's left over from previous builds a longer wire of the correct number of pins to use. Here we go. With this ESC connector. And that is going to let me <laughs> mount the flight controller facing this way and let the air unit plug in. And it's janky as heck. I'm not saying it's the right way to do it, but we're going to get through this. What if you don't have a cable just laying around that's the right length? Well, plan your builds better. <laughs> uh, no, but in all seriousness, another way to do this would be to flip the ESC around so it faces the air unit and then mount the capacitor with a couple of extension wires. Like I used, I like to just use old cutoff motor wires that I save. And the capacitor could run under the flight controller to the front of the quad the effectiveness of the capacitor would be slightly reduced but the further the capacitor is from the esc the, wor the worse it functions but that would let you not have to use any fancy weird cables and would probably be a better way to do this build in the future when you hadn't already committed to soldering up everything up the way it is so now i've got the extra long wire there i can turn the flight controller this way set it down the air unit is going to plug into this plug is the one and I know that because I read the speedy B manual and by the way the uh, the pinout for the O3 air unit and the Vista or is the same so any flight controller that has a plug for the Cadex Vista or the other DJI is going to work with this and let's just let's just give that some twists to take some of the slack out of it once again, I just want to glance and see if that wire is going to like get squished in there or crushed. It's not. Looks like there's enough space that it's it's slack. Um, make sure nothing's getting squished. Yeah, looks. Good. I'm just going to put a couple of these nuts on here. The uh, screws for the Vanover build seem like they are just a hair short of what this speedy b stack really wants i'm having to compress these gummies just a little bit 
in order to get the screws to bite, but I think it's going to be okay. If you over compress those silicone gummies, then uh, you'll hurt the vibration isolation characteristics a little bit, but I think I really don't like how close this flight controller is getting to this ESC. I'm not sure if I can catch this on camera, but some of these plugs here are getting mighty close to the heat sink and the stuff on the ESC. How much room do we have to spare here? If we compare to a standoff, none. We really have no room to spare there. Like we can't just put maybe a two millimeter longer screw and let that flight controller come up just a smidge. This is just as tight as it's going to get. And there's, yeah, it's a tight build. Why don't you use a 20 millimeter flight controller? Then you'd have more room for this tight build. Yeah, you can see if I take that screw off and let it pop up, if we didn't compress this at all, we literally would not even have room to get a screw or a nut on the end of that screw. So we're going to have to squish this down a little bit. What if I pass the ESC cable over the top? Will it reach around? Debatable. That's pretty debatable. I don't think it will. Maybe. I don't love it. It doesn't look good. This is the reason why I had to pause the build and come back to it a little while later. This is the 3D printed mount for the O3 air unit for this frame. I'll put a link to that down in the video description uh, as well. It comes from Brain3D and I assume they've got mounts for all the video transmitters you might commonly use. Uh, of course you could just you know, use some double-sided tape or something, but I figured I'd want to build this the way that Vanover builds it. Uh, this mount has M2 screw spacing. You can see here they do have a version with M3 screws and they seem to include nuts, which is nice, I guess. Um, Vanover's frame is drilled for M2 screws, so that's what we're going to use. Well, they included the nuts, but they didn't include the screws. So thankfully, I have my own M2 screw assortment. I uh, highly recommend you have a good M2 screw assortment and M3 screw assortment. It's a, a bare minimum for building most quads these days. I like to get the cap head screws. I find that they are more durable and strip out less than the uh, like the button head style. I reckon I'm going to want some washers too to keep these screws from pulling through. Um, this TPU is flexy and screw heads can easily pull through it. Oh, I see what they've done. Oh, they're very clever. Okay, no, no, I see they're very clever. We can see here that they've designed the holder with a recessed area that's uh, made to hold the nuts. So presumably they don't think it's going to rip out if we just put the screws in like so and then screw up through them. Well, we shall see. I want to make you aware of another issue that I've learned about since I started this build and it relates to the plug that is on the flight controller that you're plugging the O3 air unit into. And the issue is that some flight controllers have the wires in the opposite order. So instead of going from VBAT to SBUS, they go from SBUS to VBAT. And it's not that anybody's done anything wrong, it's that before the O3 air unit, there wasn't a DJI video transmitter that shipped with a wire with plugs on both ends. All the video transmitters that they previously shipped had one wire with a plug. If it was a full-size air unit, it plugged into the air unit. If it was the Vista, I don't even know if it came with wires. It had a plug. I can't have to look. It came with a plug, though, that would go in the flight controller, and then you would solder the wires to the Vista. This is the first DJI a video transmitter that has a plug on both ends of the wire. So now, finally, there's a standard for what direction the wires should go, and some flight controllers have it the other way around. The bottom line is that you should very carefully check that the red VBAT wire or power wire on your flight controller is paired to the red power wire on the O3 air unit so that when you power it up, you don't fry it. In the case of this Speedy Bee, it does turn out that it's correct. You basically have a 50-50 chance and everything is fine. If yours is not correct, you will need to be pulling those wires out of the harness and reversing them, or you could build your own custom harness if you wanted to do that. Oof. Oh, I see. Well, that's very clever. So it's just going to slide onto the sides here. And then the screws, or, or the nuts rather, are going to be covered up. And we're just going to line them up. We're just going to line up the nuts here 
with the holes in the frame and just put some screws through. They're gonna need to be the right length. Oof, four millimeter does, doesn't give us many threads, does it? Is it gonna bite? No, I don't think it's long enough. We're gonna go to a six, even though six might be a little too long. I think we'll make it work. Whenever you're screwing into a TPU 3D printed piece like this, don't tighten the screws down too far. If you tighten them down too far, you'll just rip right through the TPU. Uh, so you gotta find that sweet spot where it's tight enough that it's not gonna back out from vibration. It's got enough friction that it'll stay in place, but not so tight that it's crushing the TPU and, uh, and gonna, gonna just rip through. Um, Catalyst Machine Works does something really clever which is that they include, uh, I've used the wrong screw hole, haven't I? I think I've used the wrong screw. I need to use the 20 millimeter mounting holes on the inside, oops. Catalyst Machine Works does something really clever with theirs. I've never seen anybody else do this, where they include a metal sleeve inside the 3D printed piece so that the screw is biting onto a piece of metal instead of onto a piece of plastic. And it means you can really tighten it down as much as you need to. I'm not sure that would work on something this small, but it is a way of solving that problem. There's another 3D printed piece that we're gonna need to deal with, and that is the antenna holder. Uh, and in order to install this, we're gonna need to actually remove the antennas and route the wire through the antenna holder. So we get out our teeny tiny little Phillips head screwdriver. We'll pop these UFL connectors off. And I'm just gonna feed this through the antenna holder. I'm gonna feed this through the antenna holder. Mm, got it. Come on. Okay, there we go. Gotta get those UFL connectors right side by side. And I'm gonna just squeeze this in here and friction fit it. Um, uh, I find on some of these it helps to get some E6000 adhesive. It's an excellent, excellent adhesive. If you've ever used shoe goo to repair your shoes, it's similar to that in that it is um, it dries to kind of a flexible, tacky uh, consistency. It's really good for parts where things are going to vibrate a lot. And just a little bit of E6000 on just the inside of this before you set it in will help hold it in. Um, we'll just trust the friction for now and see how it works out. Grab the rear standoff. That's going to be one of the shorter standoffs. We'll go ahead and install that. Not a lot of clearance there. That hopefully won't become an issue. And we're just, let's see if we can just route these antenna wires around here in the top. We well, don't want them sticking out the back. And should probably just press down over the standoff, I'm guessing. Yes, and again, we've got a little bit of contact there, which I don't love. Can I squeeze this forward at all? Not very much. And it's very difficult to get an angle that shows you this, but we've got wires in contact here with the standoff. I kind of don't want to slide that standoff down and press on the wires. I think I'm going to take the screw out and install the 3D print first and then see if I can sort of work it in. So let's just squeeze that in. Yeah, it's pretty snug in there. Uh, we've got this bottom of the antenna coming out here. We've got these cables kind of twisted back. I don't, that's not my favorite. For the receiver, I'm going to be installing a Happy Model EP1 receiver, Happy Model Express LRS receiver. Uh, and I'm going to be using this set of pre-made cables that come with the flight controller. We're gonna to need to find the four pin RX cable. Isn't that nice? I'm gonna guess that's, let's see, four pin VTX cable, six centimeter. That's not that one. This is gonna be it. The four pin RX cable, 10 centimeter. Uh, and we're just gonna solder that to the Happy Model receiver and plug it in. Why not solder it to the flight controller? Yeah, it's fine. Uh, I've been trying plugs on these flight controllers that come with plugs, including my own JBF7V2, uh, and the theory that it, maybe it'll make repairs a little bit easier. Um, some people don't feel that plugs are secure. I have personally argued against plugs in the past and said, well, why don't we just solder it up? But uh, let's give it a try. 
Yeah, so whenever I'm soldering up uh, an EP1 receiver, I remember that the ground pad is over here on this side with the little double pad here. That's the bootloader pad, that's ground. As far as antenna mounting, we're gonna be using this 3D print again from Brain3D. It just sort of folds open like this and the antenna slides up into it. If you don't wanna get that exact print and if you have a 3D printer yourself, there are some excellent, excellent antenna mounts uh, made by Ridwan Hughes is the guy's name. He goes by License to Drive and I'll put a link in the video description to his Thingiverse uh, account. He has a ton of really, really good, simple to print. They take about 10 minutes to print, print with no supports, and hold a wide variety of antenna, antennas. And if, I mean, it's nice to have something kind of custom made for this, but um, uh, it's, his stuff is really good and I highly recommend it. We're going to grab one of the long standoffs uh, because I think that the simplest way to mount this is going to be up front, like just sort of here behind the camera or something and then we're going to just use one of the front standoffs to hold our antenna um it probably could we do it out the back no there's no standoff out the back there's no there's no standoff to put it on so we're just out of luck there we got to use one of the front standoffs the standoff's going to go here and this is going to mount oh forward forward facing oh that makes more sense yes tilt back like that I think that makes the most sense. Okay, let's go ahead and push this on through. Uh, this stuff is called Kapton Tape, K-A-P-T-O-N, and it is nice to use instead of heat shrink if, uh, in my case, my heat gun is upstairs and I don't want to run up and get it. <laughs> or, um, what's going on with my scissors? Or um, it's just a little more flexible, and not literally flexible in terms of its flexibleness, but just in terms of how easy it is to work with and wrap something that may not be exactly the size of your heat shrink. And it is see-through, so you can see the light on your receiver, which is nice. Well, according to the wiring diagram for the Speedy B flight controller, this plug right here is for the receiver, and you can see We've got a little bit of a problem here. That wire's in the way. We'll have to figure out what to do about that. Has three plugs on the side. So that's this side. The side with the receiver is the other side from the side with the GPS. So that's going to be this side, which is this plug here, which is the one that is not covered up. Yay! I lucked out. If I had just been direct soldering them, <laughs> I would have just soldered to the pads and been done. Oh no, I'm going to try and use the plugs. Let me just check that I've wired this up correctly. In this wiring diagram, we can see that ground is toward the center of the board and then power is the second one after that. And here we can see, yes, same thing, ground toward the center. I think it's very important when you're trying to check your wiring diagrams and stuff, don't think left to right, but think towards the corner of the board towards the center of the board because a lot of times the wiring diagram will be looking at the board flipped over or something and if you're thinking left and right you'll get it backwards. Pretty clever. I'm guessing that we're going to put a zip tie around this to keep it from flapping loose but uh, we'll probably do that after mm, closer to the end of the build. Mm -hmm. To mount the antenna we're going to use this Scotch Extreme mounting tape. Uh, it's just a nice sticky double-sided tape. Mm, there's a new kind of tape I learned about called Alien Tape, which some people say is even better. I've got some on order and I'm going to be trying it out, but for now, well, I'm going to feel sad because I got that big giant roll of Scotch Extreme mounting tape. See, I often end up making like a double thickness of the Extreme mounting tape because I find that one layer doesn't have enough sort of cushiness to mold itself to the thing I'm sticking down and really hold. Sometimes one layer works, but oftentimes I end up with two. And this uh, alien tape is thicker and like just really like sticky tackiness to the surface that really sticks to stuff. So I'm, I'm real curious to try that. You can find it on Amazon. It's just called alien tape. Now the O3 camera has two screw holes in it, but the mounts that Vanover provides for mounting it only have one screw hole. We're gonna see how this works. Uh, yeah, frankly, I, I'm not sure which I like better. I guess my preference is two, because two is gonna lock in the angle of the camera more securely. 
but it takes a little bit more work to design a camera mount that gives you two screw holes and still lets you adjust the camera angle. I mean, it's just like one hole and one sort of curved slot. It's not really rocket science, but um, uh, how is this gonna fit? Oh man, we are nearly there. Uh, this is the part in the build where I will now go configure it on the computer, bind it, get it all set up. It's basically done, but we haven't put the top plate on, and so if we need to make any changes, we won't have to take the top plate back off again. Uh, there are a couple other things I did real quick. I've added a zip tie around the capacitor, and it's kind of sandwiching the receiver underneath there. This receiver doesn't have a bind button. If I had a bind button, I'd be a little worried maybe about accidentally pressing the bind button with the capacitor. So I'd want to be careful about that. And I'm pretty sure I'm still going to be able to see the receiver LED so I can know if I'm bound or anything. Um, the reason I do this is twofold. Number one, if the capacitor is sort of rattling around and loose, it can create Theoretically, it could create issues with the gyro and make the quad fly worse. It's no, it's always good to keep things secured on your quad and not let them rattle around and be loose. The other is that eventually that vibration and movement would crack and break the wires to the capacitor. So that's going to protect that. And I added a zip tie here uh, to hold the antenna secure. Uh, and I just want to show you how I mounted the camera because there's several ways to do it and not all of them seem to be as good as all of them. So for the camera, I put these mounts on so that this uh, little ear that holds the camera comes out the bottom. And then I used the bottom screw hole on the O3 camera, which seems to put it pretty midway up and down the standoffs and gives you plenty of flexibility to tilt it up and down without hitting anything. Uh, to me, that seemed the best, but you could obviously play with it and see if you agree. Whenever I judge a new quadcopter frame, one of the first things I ask is, has it done anything sort of new or innovative or is it sort of just a cosmetic remix of a lot of stuff that I've seen before? And I don't mean that there's anything wrong with cosmetic remixes. If there's a particular design that works particularly well, but then somebody just puts their own little spin on it by making it a different shape or different sort of geometry, that's fine. That's perfect for somebody. But I do think that the Vanny style frame passes that test. This little design here is pretty freaking clever. And I don't know if this is literally the first frame that's ever done this. It's the first one I've seen with a similar mechanism. And it solves a problem where when you have to change a frame plate, the arms all fall off. That's pretty slick. The way that Vanover has tied the bottom plate and top plate together with these little pieces here, instead of just having screws through the arms, adds additional rigidity, perhaps additional durability. And again, it's just a little bit of a touch that shows that somebody was thinking, I like it. I also really like the compactness of the build. And I think this is gonna be a pro for someone who's very experienced with building and a big con for somebody who maybe is just on their first or second build because the compactness really contributes to the durability of the quad. So like this mounting of the Express LRS antenna, there's just no way for this to get chopped. And <laughs> these little Express LRS antennas that come with the Happy Model receivers are not that durable. The fact that mine is still in one piece and sort of speaks to that. It doesn't give you the best coverage though. If you are facing this direction and you're standing where you're standing, the antenna is fully on the other side of the frame and it's going to compromise your uh, reception. I guess you could get a, a, a diversity receiver and put one on either side and that, that would actually be really freaking cool. Likewise, Vanover has a super low profile version of the antenna holder that literally mounts the antenna like just like right here. And again, it's not going to give you the absolute best coverage, but it's going to really increase your durability in a crash. Um, this is one of the more durable frame designs that I've seen. Not necessarily because of the frame design itself. There are lots of nice durable frames in this roughly same size and weight, but because of the overall thought that's gone into the accessories where Vanover seems very willing to compromise a little bit on uh, RF range and penetration in order to get a quad he knows he's going to be able to fly home at the end of the day. I like it. I have to say that the adaptation of the frame to the O3 air unit feels a little bit uh, rushed, perhaps, would be the word that I would use. I don't know how much time they actually spent doing it, so I don't want to presume, but basically what they did when the O3 came out is they widened the, the bottom plate 
to let the camera fit, and they came up with a 3D printed bracket that holds it. And part of the problem with that is that the front of the frame doesn't fully protect the camera. Manufacturers who have completely redesigned their front end to support this camera have generally done it with vertical curved metal plates or carbon fiber plates that have better protection for the camera. In addition, having just a single screw here into the TPU means that the camera is constantly getting bumped. Uh, if it was better protected, it wouldn't be getting bumped as much, but it's constantly getting bumped and it's constantly changing the up tilt, which means that your chances of just getting right back up after a crash and continuing to fly, you're they're lower. And that would be so easy to fix with a slightly different 3D print that maybe had a little two, two screw holes with an arc to set the, the angle, but they didn't do that, and I'm not really sure why. Overall, though, I've really enjoyed the time that I've spent with this build, uh, and I've been flying it more than I do some quads that I get for a review or that I build for a build video. I find myself coming back to it. It's been pretty durable. It, you know that I don't do a ton of like bando bashing, so if you're looking for a quad you can smash into concrete again and again and again, maybe this is it, maybe it isn't, I wouldn't know. But for the kind of flying I do, it's held up really well. Uh, and I don't just mean that I have haven't like broken an arm because you have to smash a quad into a lot of trees before you break an arm. I do eventually, but I haven't yet on this one. What I mean by durability is that I have crashed it and crashed it and crashed it and it has continued to fly pretty much the same as it flew when I first built it. And that to me is where a build often falls apart. I haven't actually broken an arm yet, but somewhere I've created micro fractures and the quad just starts flying weird and the flight controller isn't behaving right and the gyro's being weird and I don't know where the problem is and then I just end up replacing the whole damn frame. That hasn't happened with this one and uh, that says a lot. If you're interested in following along with this build, there are links down in the video description where you can pick up all the parts that I used. You don't have to do this exact build. For example, if you decided to do it with a Cadix Vista instead of an O3 air unit, it would be pretty much the same. Just know that when you order the Vanny style frame, there is a different bottom plate that's used for the Vista or any of the other analog cameras compared to the O3 air unit. So make sure you order the right one. Those links down below are affiliate links. And in case you're new here, what that means is that when you use those links to purchase anything at the affiliated store, not just this stuff, but anything, you click the link, you check out, and I get a little commission. It's an easy way for you to support the channel. It doesn't cost you anything. Just remember to click the link. If you're still on the fence about the O3 air unit, then I'm gonna put a card on screen with my full review of the O3 air unit. It's pretty freaking impressive, but it does come with a few downsides. If you haven't checked that out already, I'll see you over there.